Hey everyone, it's LS, and today's sponsor is Professor. Professor is the innovative app for League of Legends on Overwolf. Professor can speed up your game with quick rune imports during champ select. You can gain early insights on your opponent's champion mastery, as well as their tendencies inside of the game. And this is trusted by over 8 million summoners. Professor ensures a safe gaming experience, fully compliant with Riot's terms of service. So for those looking to improve their gameplay and rack up more wins, follow the link in the description and discover all that Professor has to offer. Hello, everyone, and hello, LS. Thank you for the Christmas present. Uh, this was on your Christmas list, so I, I really appreciate you reaching yeah, out and uh, actually saying you do this. So I was I was shocked. I'm not gonna lie. I saw the DM. I was like, no way. <laughs> um, I I yeah. I tried to. Uh, a lot of people that asked for like um, non tangible things like this, I mm -hmm. tried to reply to like a lot, uh, just because it's you know. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I know you're probably yeah. super busy, but so, uh, yeah. How, what have you been up to lately? I know they're the, with worlds ending, a lot of content creators, stuff like that around the league scene have kind of just kind of taken a break almost, you know, going off season themselves. Like what have you been up to? Yeah. Um, well, after worlds ended, uh, I just sort of felt like the, the pressure break from this year. Cause this was the hardest year ever, uh, by riot because of the time zones, Mm-hmm. So if you were doing all three regions, with Riot like changing up the hours that each region went live at and the days, it made it the most difficult in addition to the fact that there's way more games this year. There was just more games in every single region. So yeah. after finals ended, I just thought like, okay, I'm just gonna take a break. Um, I did my like final career recap stream where I went over like the last 10 years in League. <laughs> Um, and I talked about a lot of things. There was some stuff that didn't get talked about. Um, but then that was pretty much it. And I've just sort of been on a break since. I mostly just, I mean, I play WoW every day. <laughs> uh, I'm on WoW with like viewers, other WoW pro or other league pros. Um, yeah, no, that, stuff like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know the, the remake has been super popular. A lot of people have used it as like a nice break. I've been losing my mind in solo queue while everyone is waiting for next season to start. But um, <laughs> what are your uh, preliminary thoughts on next season? Um, I haven't looked at it yet uh, because I kept saying that I wouldn't look at everything going on until it's completely finalized. Um, typically, I do this with a lot of changes because Riot just tends to change things. Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen it. I, I, um, yeah. I don't beyond think, like. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say I think a lot of the major like uh, item changes stuff like are gonna get so gutted and nerfed when when it actually releases. Yeah. So it's it's almost not worth doing a deep analysis right now. Like, uh, right, exactly, but, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the pro scene itself. Uh, you kind of already mentioned that there was way more games this year. The scheduling has changed. Uh, first off, LC L LEC did the triple split, and there was a lot of discussion about that especially in the coaching circles about how you know right after worlds ended a lot of LA, lec coaches came out and said hey this is not good this is not good for us it's not good for players um what are your thoughts on that compared to kind of the traditional two two-part split so if you go back on twitter uh in january february march when it was first happening even april um you'd see that everyone was uh very uh for it right there was a lot of positivity around it. everyone said like oh this this is really good um, and it wasn't until towards the end of summer, the championship points, uh, the LEC like championship series thing where like summer doesn't matter. It wasn't until around then and then post worlds where people started saying that it's really bad. My view on it is that objectively it is the most exciting for viewers yeah. um, and viewership of the game and the longevity of the game. And ultimately, the longevity of esports and the career of aforementioned pro players, coaches, teams, etc., is dependent on what is best for viewers. It doesn't matter about pros and coaches. Um, and mm. I've always held that stance uh, that it's community and viewers first above all else. So, because without them, I mean, it just dies. You you don't have the inflated salaries that uh, most don't deserve and <laughs> everything else without this viewership. So sure, whatever is best for viewership should just happen um yeah yeah i, I can see that um uh, my my original critique about it was the fact that it sort of devalues a championship right it feels like winning a, a championship in a three split you know where you basically played well for six weeks doesn't seem the same as winning the traditional like you know 12 week long haul like 
Um, it just it just felt like it was sort of they they kind of couched in like a performance based thing. Oh, you get more best ofs, you get more playoff experience, you get more stage time, all that. But at the same time, like the coaches from their side was like, oh, well, the performance side doesn't make any sense because now we don't have a chance to develop as a team. We just have to go straight into full speed, start winning week two. Uh, when yep. normally, like especially in LCS, for example, where we're still on the longer splits, you know, they, they look at the first four weeks as kind of a developmental period anyway. And obviously you want to win, but you're not you're not trying to have a playoff ready team in week three. Yeah. So yeah, I can. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's why you kind of saw it in LEC too, where like the early, the, the kind of lower tier teams were winning the first parts of the splits, right? Like the first split was second half of surprise, like BDS was like the best team in the LEC somehow. And right. then by the end of it, you saw the the traditional breakdown again, with G2s at the top, Fnatic's back in there. like, yeah. uh, And I think that's kind of what we expected to see. But then that changes when you have playoffs thrown in. So now teams are winning championships, but they're clearly not the best team in the league by the end of it right like well you i think, think that was the most interesting stuff right with these mm -hmm. like rapid splits mm -hmm. is that it seemed like who was best always just kept changing yeah. um in a way um and i think that the problem with that is mostly narrative uh whether it's driven by broadcast co-streamers uh live viewers um twitter reddit right um a lot of that falls into that conundrum um and it also goes to show uh just how quickly like mini tournaments almost in a way can just have different winners and i think a lot of people yeah. don't understand this if they're only used to league of legends which mm -hmm. i i find that difficult to believe because i would imagine that esports fans watch other esports so they understand <laughs> like the variance of you know best of three format or something in like starcraft starcraft one uh warcraft three um you know mlg open brackets back mm -hmm. in the day mm -hmm. um even you know uh fighting game tournaments and stuff right like the top player will come winning off a major and then he gets eliminated in eighth at the next tournament or something it doesn't mean he's not the top player uh or that he didn't just win the biggest major and then he got eliminated in eighth at the next tournament um a lot of esports fans seem to think that like skill is linear uh, yeah or something like that um, and it's not and uh, a lot of times your, your skill is demonstrated throughout the span of lots of games. Yeah. Um, and people bink tournaments all the time, or they bink series that then allow them to go on and bink a tournament. Um, and that's not what skill is. Uh, but I would argue that the average game knowledge of a viewer, spectator, etc., cetera, um, isn't at a high enough level to take in the, I guess, holistic gameplay of a team and then levy it against multi you know multi yeah well, span etc we're, we're very results-based analysis here or yeah, analysts yeah <laughs> oh, if you win you're, you're great if you lost you're just trash like yeah. that's how it is yeah. <laughs> like it's certainly certainly not the uh the best team in the entire world last year didn't win a world's finals so therefore they're overrated and Correct. probably Correct. overhyped <laughs> Um, <laughs> especially with the with with riot though right like league especially there's it's interesting that the meta will drastically shift before major events before major tournaments you'll see the world's patch is such a different meta than what teams are playing on in playoffs literally right, right. before to qualify for it so uh i think it's always gonna be really challenging to really assess teams like uh, maybe i would think adaptability would be a metric that probably needs to be more explored rather than yeah. like you know Oh, this is the best well, mid laner, think, this is best, you know, whatever. I think stuff like that is uh, a lot more exciting. And I would compare it to TCGs, right? Uh, TCGs that have a arena format um, where you draft from like a pool of cards. And so that way, if there's a pro tournament, mm. uh, so let's take like the Magic the Gathering uh, World Tour, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have the constructed decks, which everyone knows the deck lists. Everyone's very familiar with the matchups. They've all played it, you know, literally hundreds of times against each other. And then you have the draft format where the decks will quite literally never look the same, and then also no one knows what each other has. Um, and they're different skill sets. Draft right. and Constructed are, are different. And um, I think that when the meta is shaken up right before Worlds, that it makes for a more interesting viewing experience. But the problem is, is that the pro teams and coaches and whatnot, <laughs> they don't like that um, for obvious reasons, like <laughs> job security and these other types of things. But again, it goes back to viewers first. Um, and well, I think that it, objectively it makes things more exciting when, when things seem so unknown.
Now that this kind of leads to my next thing is is how do you feel about the new Fearless Draft formats coming out? So I think it's it's good. I mean, it, it, it's being like tested in the waters, but inevitably this is the direction that league has to go towards because yeah. of pro pro teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, back in 2021, I think there was a video with me and Nemesis where we 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 talked about this. Um, we said that this should just be implemented because it it, it is a form of skill expression. And again, it makes it so that it's not such a drag to keep watching pro games. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, it will be a drag because wh what I already know is going to happen. Maybe I'll, you know, if you have like VODs enabled or something, mm -hmm. um, can like clip this from like oh, six yeah. months from now. What will happen is, is um, teams will rotate the same cycles that yeah. other teams do. So even in Fearless Draft, it will gravitate back towards uh this is games game one's bands and then this is game two's bands and then instead of rotating the same two champions you're rotating the same two comps that that's sense. what's going to inevitably happen um and th that's just you know that's the that's the adaption um that would normally happen right um like watching like speed runners in a video game get like nerfed by the game company and then they have to find a new way to speed run um but they're still ultimately doing the same path yeah, I, I think it has to be combined with the best of, right? Like it, it only makes sense if you're doing yeah. longer series, uh, which I've been pushing for for LCS to to return to a best of for forever. You know, and like what, what's yes. cool is that they're testing a lot of these things in amateur. Um, so right. I I actually find, I mean, no offense to any of the teams, but I, I find watching amateur sometimes more, way more exciting. Like because you get you get one play styles that are you know they may not be as polished. But you're, you're seeing ridiculous drafts come out. You're seeing really cool matchups. You know, you're seeing actual novel ideas being tested because it's a best of two right now. I would love to see best right. of three, but they're they're willing to throw a game in the beginning to try something because the angle looks good, or they're willing to pull yeah. out a a comp because X you know amateur player is a one trick that nobody really knows how to play against Cled, and they're like, oh, I'll just pull it out. Like, um, I love that sure. kind of stuff. But yeah. it, it does agree. feel like LCS specifically is i mean and you would know this better than almost anyone is a little bit resistant to pulling out comps or drafts that are like hey this is i know this is wildly off meta but <laughs> makes <Yeah>. sense <laughs> yeah. like what was your experience like uh when you were, were coaching with c9 and, and pulling out like the soraka mid pulling things out like that like what was that met with because uh like met with in what in what sense well, clearly, when they brought—I mean, well, I assume they brought you in knowing, okay, this guy's gonna pull yeah. out something different, right? And players yeah. must have known that. So, like, when when you're like, okay, let's do this, let's try this. Is it an immediate like, uh, that sounds weird, or was it, okay? Well, we knew Ellis was gonna do this. Let's try it. Oh, or, uh, so okay, so there was the Korea Nine scrims, and there was the LCS, uh, like Academy LCS Fusion, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. And in the Korean Iron scrims, when I was playing mid lane, I was playing those champions that Fudge eventually went on to play. Mm -hmm. So everyone already knew that those champions had an extremely high likelihood to get played. Um, however, uh, Fudge did like first time Soraka on stage. Yeah. Um, and we decided on Soraka like a few hours before the game. Uh, and so we did 1v1s um, at LCS to do the Soraka. I was never. I was like met with resistance on some things, but it was never like a a, a no. Um, yeah. And then obviously there's some stuff that never came out on stage. Um, like, you know, Summit uh, did play a champion that I, I would have not preferred, and there was even a hover uh, like for game uh, gangplank um, instead of Atrox, like in the the Team Liquid game. And mm -hmm. he just said that he wasn't confident. Yeah. Um, and so it. it you know, and I understand this. I understand that it's not a thing that happens overnight and it takes time and stuff and you progress towards it. Um, but I know there's like a lot of uh, theories or something that like I had difficulty getting players to play things, but it never really was the case. Um, I think one of the only like actual things that we did have, but we never played it, even though it was our, one of our highest win rate uh, champions was Shogath. Um, and Berserker just said that he wouldn't be able to land Q against good players. Um, so there, there was something like when Gumiyushi uh, used it or something, there was like a, you know, an internal meme where, you know, how did Gumiyushi land cues? Um, <laughs> and it was like, because he used it in LCK, yeah. Uh, yeah. which Berserker would find to be superior players. <laughs> um, so stuff like this. Now, there was the, there was the thing where um, 
I don't know. Like we talked about this after me and Max, um, because Max obviously ended up leaving. Yeah. Um, and why Summit wouldn't play or do other things after I left, and I thought it was the Korean cultural uh, age thing because Summit mm. I think is older than Max. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's the case, or I don't know if it's because me and Max have very different personas. Um, with how we. I, I guess just not not conduct ourselves, but um, I, I've noticed. I I, yeah, I've noticed. I notice a cultural tendency with uh, Korean players in particular of only kind of listening to Korean coaches. Uh, that's, yeah, that's sort of been across multiple orgs, multiple teams, not just one player in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, and, of course. A lot yeah. of it does have to do with age. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, or sure. even or even relative uh, accomplishment level, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. if you're a Korean coach who was also a high level pro who also you know played against right, them, right, right, right. Yeah, right. then you're like, oh, yeah. okay, fine. You know, we, we respect that. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting because it seems like the the style of team that you wanted to implement or you wanted to train is almost at odds with that Korean culture, right? Of let's have a very very fluid. Uh, dynamic drafting process not meta you know like there, there's very little i guess uh structure to the actual like these are the like when i when i see most lcs teams now right when they go to when i go to their draft meetings and stuff, i see them do their yeah. whole draft board it's very much set like what two or three champions each player wants to play on stage that yes. week there, yeah, there's really good. little deviation from that you know yes yes, yes. and they'll very draft good. to that they'll try to draft in order to force those picks into the board right right right, right. But yeah, um, that seems like, you know, maybe uh, if you were to take that philosophy and implement it with like, like I said, an amateur team where they're already open ended, they're already like, hey, let's try whatever might have been about. Also, it seems like that kind of system would require a lot of time. That is not a, a that's not that's not a program you can develop in six weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> like, and yeah. I don't think anyone would expect it to. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I still did feel very good with how much was done in such a short period. Absolutely. Um, I because mean... again, there, there, there were other champions that after I left things that we did have like practice and we had really good success rate, even in mm -hmm. Korea when I was playing mid lane, um, it just never came out. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that was the biggest thing about that whole season <clears throat> or that whole split, I should say was a lot yeah. of people said the same thing it was like it was a one it was the most ex exciting time to watch lcs for a while um yeah i'm not gonna lie like I, I was genuinely hyped every week to just see what was gonna happen on stage uh and it, it sort of like raised this expectation of lcs that being said i mean it was probably you know it was, it was spring split it was very early on who knows how things would have gone long term but early success always kind of brings the excitement level up and then sort of sets the precedent of like Maybe there's something we can build on. It was sort of disappointing to see like no one else kind of continue doing that, right? Like innovating new draft right. picks, stuff like that. It started becoming, you know, every time I hear pro players in meetings talk about their draft, it's always like, well, we know this is good. And right. we watched LCK, they're playing this, this must be good. And they, they kind of just slot it in. This is the answer right. to this, you know. Um, what do you think it would take for lcs to either because okay my, my thing is i've never thought lcs was going to catch up to lck or lpl by copying what lpl and lck are doing that that just logically doesn't make sense to me right i mean so what is the answer in your opinion what what is the way that we actually progress the well, skill level you don't you don't chase where people are going and you don't chase the top of the mountain you you aim above it um right. or you you aim to the next summit that is not that summit um and and doing so you develop or you find out or figure out uh methods that allow you to do things that even they're not doing mm -hmm. um and naturally we actually see this on on players that are like on the come up or something like that because they'll be the first ones to adapt things that aren't being done by the current gen and we see this in every single game um now i'm on my 20th year in esports uh across like so many different games so i can make tons of references to various different esports where they were very fleshed out right um and, and we saw the same exact trajectory same exact patterns um same exact developments um and it it feels painful to be able to not only point to it uh, but demonstrate that it's already happened time and time and time again um and no one listens uh to it in a way does that make sense yeah um yeah. so like uh, and I'm getting a little sidetracked right now. I, this is the same reason that Max Waldo quit. 
Um, and I mean, I hope that he'll talk about it one day or something. It was the it was the flight after Chicago uh, where he said he just realized uh, that people don't get it, um, and it was just an emptiness uh, where there were celebrations or something backstage after winning Chicago, um, and they were started talking about worlds and all this other type of stuff, and he just felt a emptiness uh, or like a void. Um, as if to feel as though they don't realize how far behind they are and what is actually needed to make improvements and catch up. Um, and that, I think, is what led to him quitting. I, I um, think and that's... I'm sort of at the same exact point now. I, yeah. I, I, like, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a crossroad. So to answer your question, what needs to happen, right? Um, it, there, I don't know... There, there's no, um, there's no simple solution because uh, th there's not people one that want to do it, but it, it, it's also, I mean, I'm sure that you experience this in personal training and stuff. There is no instant eight pack abs, <laughs> um, you <laughs> know, or there, there yeah. is no instant, you know, 10% body fat or something right. like that. Right. Um, and because of that, people don't want uh, to do that. Right? They, they want something that will supplement them mm -hmm. to allow them to perform above their caliber in some way, right? Mm -hmm. some manner, some facet. Um, and that, that's what they would rather have. Um, they want steroids, which right. is also why they, they always call for roster changes. It's why they always call for, oh, we have to get this person. We need this person. Yep. We, let's get this really big roster, etc. The... Lowell Esports ecosystem is more akin to people chasing steroids um, than actually attempting to uh, understand everything that's going on. Spe specifically um, Western League, though, right? No, no, no. Western League is infinitely more equipped than Eastern League. But, but I'm saying that's chasing this immediate improvement rather than like, hey, we have systems that are developed that we're going to be able to long-term improve in. Um, no, so I, I would, uh, I would say that Western League holistically is way ahead of Eastern League, um, in terms of, uh, well, not necessarily financial support anymore. Uh, they were, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, like the actual coaching staffs that Western League teams have hmm. are infinitely more equipped at breaking down problems, explaining it, um, identifying problems, the data, et cetera. It all dwarfs Eastern League. Eastern League doesn't have anything like that. Eastern League is literally like walking into those like huts um, and, that have no technology, but they make amazing food uh, mm -hmm. or like something like that. You know what I mean? Um, so it really is just, Western, a player, it's just a player based diff. Like their players it, it's are a overall player so and much cultural better. difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 It's a player and cultural difference. So, so as a whole, would you say then that most Eastern teams are almost player driven in terms of how they practice, how they perform, how they get better? Versus Western, where it seems like the players do their thing, but the coaches are the ones trying to dictate where the team goes. Uh, yeah, yeah, for the most part. That's interesting. And yeah. the 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 reason that the West has been able to catch up in the last couple of years is because League of Legends, in a way, has sort of hit a limit yeah. of what more you can get good at. Right, right. And it's because of this limit that allows the f facade, or and I, and I don't know, I don't know what you would want to call it, um, that the West is like really close. Um, mm -hmm. I do wholeheartedly believe the West is close enough to bink series. Yeah. I think that yeah. that is real. Um, uh, I, I, was, I wanted to ask yeah. you that because obviously I'm not, I'm not high elo enough to truly analyze the game, but I, I, I think in my view, my just general opinion of watching a lot of league over the last few years, we, the, the specifically the LCS has looked a lot more competitive against the East in the last couple of years yes. than in years past, even in 2018, when, you know, C9 made semis. I don't think they actually looked as good as the West did now. I think we threw a few games, uh, yeah. which really, really sucked. But like, that is what it is. You get into your own heads about things sometimes. I was saying right. uh, against the LNG game, um, you know, C9 100% wins that game if they just played it like anyone but LNG. You know, if they were against FlyQuest in that scenario, they don't run down mid. Right, like they they just back. They they got Baron. They just back. Yeah, there's a lot well, of things. I mean, right, exactly, exactly. But yeah, yeah I, I definitely feel like they're closer. It's just everyone online, everyone on Reddit, everyone on Twitter is like, oh, we we lose again. We're like the U.S. or the, the LCS is garbage. Right, they they can't win a game. Yeah, and it's like, but you did you watch the games? Like, it's it's so close, so many times. But I, I understand what you mean too. With like, it almost feels like well, at some point 
there's only so much efficiency you can crank out of an entire game of League of Legends, right? If if yes. all these LPL and LCK teams have gotten to the 99th percentile of efficiency in how cleanly they can play the game, and we're at 95%, we're still going to lose almost every game. But yeah. it's going to be real close. And yeah. that that's what you said. is like it kind of starting to feel like that now, where we might have been 20% behind, now we're like 15% behind or 10% behind. Yeah, and... The the thing is, is that um, you know, if if you take the best, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a, a really apt analogy. Um, there is a limitation to how much a superior player can display that they're superior over your, over you if right. the sample size is ten games. Right. Right. When you're already both so close. Right. Makes sense. Um, it would be like it would be like um, you know how many games do you have to watch of Magnus Carlson to show that he's really that much better than uh, Hikaru? Yeah. Right when they're so close. Right. Um, and I think people don't realize that. Yeah. Um, you you need so when Worlds comes around and a team only plays ten games, people can't grasp it. And I think that Riot has done a phenomenal job with this that Blizzard failed at. Because Blizzard had so many tournaments internationally, mm -hmm. and it made people realize real fucking quick that Korea just fucking owns you. Korea enslaves you <laughs> is pretty much what Blizzard did. Yeah. And Blizzard, they tried to dial it back, and they tried to region lock it, but it was already too late. No one cared anymore. Yeah. And so all these people on Twitter, and I see it all the time, they're like, oh, give us more international events, more international events. They don't realize that that's the trajectory that Blizzard went down. Um, and if people released their scrims against uh, challengers teams, um, so like for instance, I know with a hundred percent certainty that T1's third team had a massively winning record over uh, some world's teams, a massive yeah. fucking winning record. These are fourteen-year-old kids. I'm not surprised that are just shitting on your world representatives. Yeah. So now again, now imagine an open, uh, open bracket tournament where you can just have 200 Korean teams. The Western teams are not making it to the round of 16. Yeah. They, they cannot fade enough bullets. Like, they, it's just not going to happen. That, that's really tough because, yeah, if you took, you know, most of our, and pretty much 99% of our amateur teams here, they're not beating the eighth place LCS team 10, 10 out of 15 games. There's no way. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's actually kind of disappointing, but, uh, I'm not surprised. It, it kind of, it goes back to your original point about player based diff, right? Like if you took like the top 10% challengers in China, they're probably beating an LCS team. You throw them on a five man team, they'll, they'll beat them in some scrims. Like they'll probably throw down. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see just like the level of talent that's not even being utilized in those regions, just players yeah. streaming or players just, you know, playing at the highest level, but making TikToks and stuff, like boosting, right? It's probably more lucrative to boost. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I guess with the organizational side of LCS then, right? You're saying that we have the we have the coaching staffs and do you feel competency is a thing or is it just the fact that the organization is there? Competent, uh, competency in what way? Like, do you think they're doing a good enough job of getting teams to improve over the course of a year? Uh, mo most teams are all player led. Hmm. They're all player led. And is that something you think is ideal or is that something that just, it is the way it is? No, it's just, it's a byproduct of the scene. Yeah. I, I yeah. think that's just how it is. Um, there's things I should say that I won't, uh, <laughs> like from, from, from a really funny story. I mean, okay. I'll, I'll say it without mentioning names. Um, there was a, there was a whole new roster that was brought together, um, for LCS, right? Mm -hmm. Totally, totally like new roster put together etc and they're boot camping for their very first week uh or like second week or something and um at the the dinner with all like the players and stuff um everyone is already complaining about like uh the staff the coaches and stuff right but those coaches go on to stay for the entirety of the year um but like it happens that quickly in like a week or two weeks and there's a lot of players that have good relationships, I think, with mm -hmm. some coaches. And I think a lot of it has to do with politics um, because job security and stuff. And we, we see a lot of, like, very questionable roster changes that happen oh. in some regions. Um, and there's absolutely nepotism that goes on there. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a weird, like, house of cards 
situation. Um, all of this stuff. And it's troublesome in a way, too, that no one talks about it more. Um, yeah. It's yeah. unfortunate. Everyone kind of sort of knows that, right? There's, they know there's a lot of nepotism. They know that there's certain people like that have been around forever. Um, I, right. I've always, I've always had sort of a, a critique of LCS orgs I've worked with in that environmentally, the orgs don't support uh, an environment that's comparable to other pro sports. Uh, meaning, coaches should be sort of held to some degree of esteem until they prove otherwise, right? Like the fact that players will come in and be like, "I don't trust this coach" because they were like diamond one peak or whatever and it's like well yeah, yeah maybe but have you actually listened to what they're saying have you looked at what they're saying it doesn't make sense to you rather than immediately thinking like not this rank they don't know anything about the game i can't listen to them right so i i've, I've always had issues with that and um it, it's it sort of makes it challenging because then how do you improve right as a player you have to objectively think how do you actually improve unless there's so much ego that you you know they're thinking oh i'm already I'm already as good as I can be, or I'm going to be able to compete against freaking faker. Like, uh, right. Which clearly nobody here has. Uh, I mean, I guess not, not as a team, I should say. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you, uh, Griffin, I saw Griffin in the chat. Uh, what's, what's going on with him? Like, uh, going to T1 now, are we going to see a little bit more, uh, NA to LCK interaction both ways? <laughs> Griffin, Griffin's my fucking adopted son or something. I don't know. <laughs> or, uh, I feel like um, your, your tweets yeah. and his quotes, are just, they, they, they have me dying. Griffin messages <laughs> me every day. Yeah, I can't, I can't focus. Um, it's, it's the most esports no, thing funny. I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I love but, it. I love yeah, it. I, I, I'm so excited to actually see that happen because it just, it just highlights something I've always thought is true is like, there's a ton. Uh, there's a ton of players here that just don't get the shot, right? They either don't get scouted, yeah. they don't know the right people, they, I don't know, they didn't get the shot that in the time frame they had, and they have to make a decision. They're like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to school. I'm gonna go do something else. Um, right. And it, it's unfortunate because uh, there's there's been a ton of probably very mechanically talented players who have a ton of ability and just basically never got their shot. And so they just fade out. And then that that's kind yeah. of the people in LCK LPL who just, they do get the shot. Maybe the scouting is better there. What are your thoughts on scouting and LCS? And like, how do we improve that? At least player identification. Scouting, so scouting in LCK seems to be, um, from my experiencing it, both knowing coaches that were scouters mm -hmm. and seeing it firsthand. Basically they go down the entire ladder and they friend at everyone. And then they ask, what's your age? And then if that certain team has an age uh, requirement, then they unfriend them after like saying like, oh, sorry, you know. Um, and then if the person's eligible to test, they invite them to the tryouts. Hmm. And the tryouts are obviously all ho hosted locally. Some of them are hosted online. Um, and that, that's what scouting is. There's not scouting like what people think is scouting. There's not some Korean wizard um, that knows like what they're watching uh, and all this other stuff. A lot of it is just complete random chance. Wow. Um, now, for top teams, the, the same can also be said in the Esther years, and you can demonstrate that this is what was happening. Um, top teams will always attract the top talent. Sure. Um, in most cases. And the really funny stories, and, uh, you know, I hope, like, Joe Mar... Uh, uh, <laughs> You're about to get yourself in trouble. Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let me, let me think about this. Uh, let me think about this. Okay. Be... Hold on, let me think. Let me think if he'd uh, if he'd be upset. Um, hold on. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna not say anything. You know, it's been yeah, a yeah. it's been a calm. That's fair. That's fair. It's been a calm New Year's. Right? <laughs> we're start, me, me we're starting Tito. first day of the year with a banger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, never mind. Um, the 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 TLDR is that some of the best players in Korea were actually disregarded, like the current best players in Korea. Um, some of them. Uh, not Faker, uh, obviously, but like some of the newer the newer players, right? In the last like five years, six years, um, they were basically touted as just garbage hmm. by these scouts, coaches, hmm. uh, whatever you want to call them. Um, now they're the best players, uh, in, not not even hmm. in Korea in the world, um, or like some of them were right before they went on to like retire and stuff. So. Yeah, that that is Eastern scouting. That, that's kind of, no... that, kind of, that kind of begs the question that like, what are they looking at? You know, what what determines a they're valuable? Not looking at anything. They're looking at uh, internal scrim results. That's the, it. the eyeball test and like. 
That is literally it. Yes. Oh my God. All right. So, so they're actually not that much better than LCS. They just basically have better players. The players vote the other players in typically. That's wild. I, I know. So like, yeah. I, I mean, Griffin's in the chat or something, yeah. right? Uh, so this is, this is pretty funny. Um, I think it was like Griffin tested. And then at the end of Griffin's test, T1 removed the other jungler. I think that I think that's all that happened. Yeah, like it, it actually happens like that. That is that is what happens. Like you gapped him, you're gone. Like <laughs> quite literally, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes right. there's yeah. other things that go into it. Like that player already kind of wants to leave no, I see. because they're young and they're not used to the pressure and the environment and stuff. I see. Um, but yeah, stuff like that. I, I almost feel like maybe on the Western side, like on LCS side, we're, we're just uh, we're overthinking it, maybe. Like we're we're going to the point of like oh the eyeball test isn't good enough and like we we can't tell who's good and who's not. Do team dynamics matter? Do personalities matter? Uh, but well, so if you listen to a lot of the stuff that I'm saying that Eastern teams do, it's actually the same stuff that we're criticizing that the Western teams should never do. Right, right. And that that's what I'm like trying to yell at the clouds about is that a lot of like it seems like people are trying to look towards China and Korea for like answers or solutions. And the irony is that uh, it's not it's not good. If we um, do everything they're doing, we'll be worse. Be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense, actually. Um, I think uh, it's it's super interesting actually that that you bring it up that way because we we almost have this. Like, obviously, we're not. I I don't know enough about the logistics of how LCK teams recruit i i knew that they went and they messaged challenger players but i thought it was more of a system of like hey this player's popping off in challenger let's reach out and see what they do but it's literally just friend request everyone see who qualifies put them into a ring together whoever survives gets a shot like right that's interesting that's super interesting um but that also makes sense and why you would perhaps rate a player as low and then when you actually give them a shot and then they make it to the main team on you know t1 all of a sudden they're winning worlds Right, like we we've seen it in the LCS yeah. too. So many players who just absolutely were considered garbage and washed up or past their prime. We'll talk about that too. Past their prime, what does it even mean anymore? You know, like contracts right. comes back to win his only his LCS championship in like the eighth year he's played. You know, like he was on academy for three years, like all this didn't have a team. Comes back and actually wins wins LCS and then actually competes pretty well at Worlds. Um, I I personally don't think skill level in league is is age gated. Um, especially not before 30. Uh, but, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, uh, age rated? Age, age gated. gated, yeah. Like, I, I think that there's a huge idea. I've seen it both in the coaching level and the, pro, and the player level. I've seen there, there's some sort of, like, cap on people's ceiling. And once they once you see their ceiling, they're not going to get much better than that. Um, well, I mean, all right, so my, my, my thoughts on, uh, mechanics like this and other stuff, um, is more that, uh, it's more about how weathered someone is more than anything. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, so what I think is going on is like a 15 year old who's played the game for six years is identical to a 21 year old who played the game for six years. Got so it. even though they're 27 and they're 21, um, they both have the same amount of weathering going on. And what I mean by mostly weathering is they have habits that they've developed, they've had things that they've seen a million times over, etc. Um, and they have, you know, ideas about the game or like what you should and shouldn't do and yada yada yada. So they're equally weathered. Um, as for like physical mechanics, no, I don't think that um, it's the most important thing in the world, but I do think that someone that gradually does get older, there is a subconscious allocation uh, that would go on and, uh, towards things that don't just pertain to, let me be the very, very best in this video game. Yeah. And whether someone wants to control it or not, it is on your mind subconsciously. Um, and I think that that plays a really big factor. Sure. People always reference, um, you know, the reference fighting games, the reference CSGO, the yeah. reference uh, Street Fighter... Um, you know, these things, and they'll say, well, there's players that are in their 30s and 40s, and they're still professional players. And then you look at the amount of new player pool that comes in um, that is actually youth, hmm. and it's non-existent right. um, to an extent. Now, what we do know from StarCraft 1 and WarCraft 3 is quite literally the teenagers won everything. There hmm. was never an incident where a player in their mid-20s contended and got close to beating the teenagers. Um, 
I think that that's a really, really fascinating data point. Do you have um, an opinion on why? Because, uh, well, is it actually mechanics? I mean, that that that's the big question, right? Yeah. Um, to, is to it be actually fair, the mechanics? To be fair, longer? I think I mean our RTS mechanics are infinitely harder. <laughs> Like, then yeah, Star, the, StarCraft mechanics are much, yeah. much, much harder. They're, yeah. they're they're arguably the hardest in the world. I, I watching um, Pro StarCraft made me never ever want to touch the game again. Like yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so quite literally, yeah, teenagers could not be beaten in StarCraft one. Yeah. Um, and you were considered ancient if you were twenty one in StarCraft, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, like that that range of age. Hmm. So. I don't know if there's like legitimacy. I don't think that there's enough of a, a, a data point and stuff. Now, I do think um, that with the way that stuff flows and all this other type of stuff, yeah, I, I don't think it's ever actually something that prevents you. At least not in modern. That makes sense. Um, modern gameplay. Well, and and it, maybe yeah. League is just not intensive enough for it to ever actually come to fruition well, compared I, to like something like StarCraft. <laughs> As compared to well, your examples too, the the players that are older are competing in like fighting games, competing in CS:GO, the variables don't change that much in those games, mm. right? Like you play Street They're Fighter, static, yes. yeah, you you don't you don't relearn the meta every every three weeks, you know? It's like mm. everything is sort of consistent, yes, it's, it's, you know, season to season. So, yes, yeah, a lot less well, time. Um. Yeah. So there's an interesting conversation that uh, I've had on this to an extent. Um, yes, they're, they are, uh, I would argue in many, many ways that League is patchless. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of my, that's one of my really strong claims. Uh, and I think there's, again, I think there's a very easy way to demonstrate that it is effectively patchless. Um, even using patchless games such as, uh, StarCraft 1 and WarCraft 3. Um, uh -huh. and the argument and uh, this, uh, this conversation originally happened on trash talk with double lift and Cadrel, mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't think through the argument and conversation enough, um, to where the obvious rebuttal that league has a patch every two weeks, um, you know, obviously means that it's not a patchless game. Um, whereas my main claim is that riot changes so little throughout right. the course of a year, it is effectively a patchless game because of the sheer volume of games that a pro player would need to play for the patch alteration to actually have played a part in their individual game. Um, mm. And the way that I liken this to StarCraft 1 and WarCraft 3 is um, StarCraft 1 and WarCraft 3 altered their maps every two months. They were brand new maps, not even like rotating maps, completely brand new. Right. This altered the timing attacks. It altered the unit compositions. It altered the spawn locations. It altered the travel distance. It offered, uh, altered what could you possibly defend with. Right. Sometimes you didn't need as many units because of certain things. The pro players constantly were in a cycle every two months, do or die as well for StarCraft because mm -hmm. one, the salaries were not nearly as big. And then in addition to that, um, uh, you know, the, the player life was not as big. You were basically out of the game by the time you're 2021. Mm. So effectively, League, StarCraft, and WarCraft are identical in that they are patchless games. Um, the maps that were released by the tournament organizers, OSL, MSL, um, and other, you know, various ones, World Cyber Games, uh, etc., in the early 2000s, is identical to the two each patches that Riot releases for League of Legends. Um, so that's, that's the counter-argument or the easy rebuttal that uh, people don't want to accept. Hmm. League is a patchless game for the most part. That makes sense. I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I could think of it as like, well, the patch isn't drastic enough to, to change the game Correct. as a whole. Correct. It, it just changes, oh, this champion's a little stronger now or whatever. Uh, I do, like, once they... Yeah. This Sorry, season, fine. well, this season is going to be the big patch, right? Like, the, the whole map is changing. This season will be a big patch in the same way that StarCraft Two has big patches. And then it goes immediately back to being a patchless game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it only lasts a short amount of time, which is what's so fucking fascinating, um, is that you have all of this patchless game and you don't engage with it because you perceive it as a patched game. Right. Um, it's like you have to drastically... And me and Max used to talk about this all the time. Yeah, it's like, like when people think, oh, my, my champ got nerfed, I can no longer use it. And it's right, like, right, right. You, so, so you've lost like Ezreal, um, 580. Right, like... so... Right, 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 exactly. You lose 10 damage yeah. on an ability. Now, if that ability alters your the speed at which you can push a lane, like by a dramatic amount, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're talking like Ravenous Hydra nerf uh, early last season uh, or whatever, two seasons ago, right? Um, 
if we're talking about that type of stuff, okay, sure. Um, that does immediately impact your champion. You play a thousand games, it has an impact in a thousand games. Mm -hmm. But if we do something like, okay, uh, Kossadin gets, you know, 0.5 AP or like 0 0.0 something AP on an ability, the pro player has to play 500 Kossadin games. And even in those 500 games, he's overkilling the enemy target by higher than that math amount, which sure. means that it played no effect. Right. Um, and it right. might not have played an effect in the lead up to it and all this other type of stuff, which means that it's actually a, a patchless patch so, so in, you, in that regard. Do you, do you feel like the meta I'm then getting is angry? Sort of, just, well, no, <laughs> do, you, do you feel like oh the meta God, then is. Stay it, away from <laughs> League. I'm, getting, I'm actually getting so mad. I'm sorry to bring oh you back into this. <laughs> Like, do you feel I've like been the, away like, for two months, I'm about to fuck it. The, the, the meta then gets almost uh, pushed subconsciously. Like, people are like, this champ can't be good yes, now. Yes, it is. So and so it, they just stop playing it. Fucking, yeah. yeah, the thing that makes me want to blow up my vocal cords about this is it's all demonstrable. It's, <laughs> you, you can't argue, uh, whether it be mathematically or the, the demonstrations that have been supplied time mm -hmm. and time and time again um, by other games and stuff. You can't argue with this stuff, and yet... I've talked about it for three fucking years, um, and as large as I got uh, as you know a co-streamer in my absolute peak and all this other type of stuff, I feel like I failed as a person because it didn't seem like I could get that message across. And no matter what amount of effort uh, with demonstrations or just attempting to be objective, uh, whatever, and it goes back to the tweet chain that you and I actually had where reading comprehension. Uh, do, you, yes. do you recall that one? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that that is a really big part of it. And I can forgive people that are ESL, um, mm. I can forgive people that are ESL in that regard, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a, a really big part of that goes back to that. And um, so, yeah, metaphorically, it, it, it has completely broken me. And so well, uh, even like while we're having this brief discussion about it right now, I am getting emotionally charged. And, I, and it's I, not a good emotion, which is I, like why I, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I'm sorry. And I, I hate to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, it's fine. It's I fine. always, you know, actually, that's what I said to you. I really appreciate that you especially, but people, certain people out there are willing to challenge the norm and just be like, hey, this is what I think about this. And this is why. And it's not right or wrong. It's not anyone's stupid or anything. Like, it's just like, right. hey, here, here's something that I've thought about. And here are my grounded reasons as to why you've established your premises yes. and you've drawn a conclusion. We should be able to discuss that, you know? Yes. And yes. unfortunately, I can understand you've been doing this for a long time and it's frustrating that it doesn't seem to change very much. But I, I think yes. it's super important that you can, people, not you specifically, if you don't want to, I'm not going to challenge your mental health by forcing you back in a league scene. But uh, I think it's super important that people continue to do that. You know, I've... I've sure, absolutely. You know, I, I don't think there's anyone that really does it anymore. And some people that do, I've noticed that they've shifted away from doing it. Um, and I can only assume it's because they don't like the blowback. Right, right. Um, and uh, you know, I so I'll say this. I, I think he does such a phenomenal job, and I think it's why he actually got so much attention um, when he first appeared on Twitter, like Molecule. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. At the same, uh, you know, in the same vein, I think Molecule Old does a really fantastic job at doing all of this stuff. And then at the same time, sometimes he actually just posts stuff that moves the the needle in the other direction, and it's counterintuitive. And I have to wonder why is that the case? Well, um, and I think a lot of people don't want to be non-agreeable and they don't want to be disliked it's um, it's hard to get constant negative feedback for sure yes but at the same time it's yes, like exactly. you know and, and it could also be sometimes sometimes people are also just wrong right like you, you can't be right 100 sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. of the time sure. so it, it's uh it's really tough because I, I i've dealt with a lot of that myself just in obviously i'm low elo but i have thoughts about the game right like hey this is my experience yeah. it's not enjoyable at times um, but I try to defend at least my opinion on it from an objective standpoint of like, this is why I don't like it, right? Like, these are the things that I see in game that don't make sense to me. And higher elite players might disagree, like, oh, this is what this is, or like, whatever, try to explain it. But I'm like, it doesn't make it right. It just means that, okay, that is the system that's currently in place, right? Recently, I got into a whole bunch of crap about MMR and like LP and right. all this stuff. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense that MMR is based on a season long performance standard of wins, losses. If I got coaching for for three months mid season, would it not be expected that I statistically should climb faster after that? Like I should be playing better than that, right? But then why am I being gated over a hundred games by previous MMR when I can go on a fresh account and immediately get to plat overnight? Yes, it doesn't sure. make sense, right? Like why would you gatekeep an account because it's got old MMR? Uh, I'm not sure of yeah, I'm not sure of the answer. 
like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a rhetorical question because it just doesn't make sense to me. Right. And a lot of, right. a lot sure. of players just don't want to have that discussion. Like, Oh, they just immediately throw out that, you know, if you just win more and you're better, you'll just climb. I'm like that. That's not actually an answer though, because we're talking about a system. Right. But I, I, I get it. Like a lot of people don't want to have those kinds of conversations because the blowback sucks. The dealing with the constant negativity sucks. Um, league community as a whole doesn't know how to communicate. Uh, yeah, like we, yeah. we talked about, like, how can you, how can you jump straight from having a rational conversation with someone to all of a sudden just name calling, you know, like pulling out random yeah. personal BS, like it's, it's wild. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let, let's get back to like the actual like pro scene. We'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here. Um, do you watch amateur at all or do you, do you only watch like challenger or? I do not. No, no. Okay. Um, I was just curious. Somebody asked if you would be willing to watch NA amateur at all, but I'm like, I, if you're trying to step away from league, that seems like the wrong direction. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm super excited to see how fearless goes, especially with the best ofs and, and maybe, maybe give LCS team signed a kind of a, a glimpse of like, Hey, here's some alternative play styles that might work or some things we can pull out. Cause I yeah. agree with you. Like we're, we're never going to beat LC or LC LCK LPL by playing, their style pro, you know, traditional macro meta comps. Like, how are you going to play a meta comp against another meta comp when they're just statistically better than you at every position? Right, right, like, right, right. It doesn't make sense. Um, the games yes. that we take, it, you you look at uh, minor regions who take games off of major regions. It's like they play all this crazy stuff. You know, you got like, I don't know, like mage bots. You got all sorts of alt, like off meta junglers. Yeah. Like that's the way to go. Like just, you know, throw them into a fist right. fight, ro- increase variability, see what happens like yes but um okay and then what do you think sets i guess great teams apart from good teams right now like if it's if it's player driven you think coaching doesn't really matter all that much in terms of player development no i don't think i don't think it play, i i i think coaching uh, counts for i think I, I think actually coaching in the mass majority of cases hurts more than it helps hmm like because it puts them into a box or it restricts well, because or... we're we're ultimately using conjecture, right? In a way, mm-hmm. and from what I know from being a fly on the wall in many, many, many teams and my relationships with lots of different players, House of Cards and politics are it's an extremely plentiful thing. Um, and it sounds like most coaches get dragged into being a political person, not like, uh, you know, educator or anything like that. So, using pure conjecture, if we're talking about you know fifty, hundred teams in the world, there's no way for me to know. Um, if you, and unless you ask me about like specific things and I'm only going to speak about things, um, that I can substantiate or, um, that I, I know of things, uh, you know, firsthand or, uh, by someone who's experiencing it firsthand or something like that. Um, so in that regard, um, I think that there's nothing that's been displayed and, uh, that would, that would allow us to answer in any way other than this. Mm. Yeah. That, and that's kind of unfortunate because I, I, we'd like to see a system that actually makes sense, right? Like the traditional sports model, like coaches should help players develop, maybe not teaching them the game, but teaching them how to grow, how to develop as players, how to improve their skills, how to identify weaknesses. Sure. Uh, that should be what coaching is, but it ends up being a, a nuts and bolts thing of like, oh, let's talk about this champ matchup and really, you know. Oh, so know. the the um, response that I can give to this is, mm-hmm. Um, let, let's go back to one of the original conversations that um, we had, where the East is always, or the Western teams are always guessing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they always just copy and mimic the East. They don't actually understand what's going on. Um, now, <laughs> oh shit. Um, now I am unfamiliar uh, with like some of the stuff. Like I know you're a personal trainer and other stuff, right? Um, but like, do you know? Uh, and just tell me if you don't, or like if I'm just missing here, I'm totally fine to be wrong. Um, do you know like what actually goes on inside of uh, the digestive tract or the muscles um, when they rip apart the repair and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. Do, do you know about all of that? Uh, or Generally, yeah. Uh, okay. I, uh, I've taken physiology, I've taken, but I don't know it at the level of like, let's say a registered dietitian would. Okay. Yeah. So the very first time, so I got personal training from the same person that did like owner mm-hmm. and other people. He's Paul Cho, he's on FlyQuest now. Um, and my first time ever doing stuff with him, he told me things that you would hear from everyone, like why you do certain exercises or eat certain things and yada, yada, yada. But he accompanied that with the fact that he has a literal doctorate and I think he's a surgeon 
Um, mm -hmm. And he was able to quite literally tell me what's going on with the muscles and mm -hmm. what's going on with the digestive tract mm -hmm. um, and what's happening uh, with certain foods. Um, and he was able to tell me on a really fundamental level, mm -hmm. um, which means that you can strip Paul of everything, put him in a cave somewhere, and he's still able to walk out of the cave, find things, and then apply the logic because it's happening at a, a molecular level. Right. Um, the logic. Most people in coaching, Western scene, are former pro players. Okay, they're former pro players. Who were they getting coached by? Well, they were getting coached by former pro players. Okay, who are the former mm -hmm. pro players getting coached by? They were getting people that were just hired because Riot mandated a rule that made coaches have to exist inside of teams as well as analysts. Okay, so it sounds like we don't have anyone who was ever operating at a molecular level mm -hmm. explaining what the fuck is going on. Now, I do think that people like this do exist inside of the scene. I think that Vigar demonstrates, right? And this is why yeah. I've always been an advocate of people that demonstrate. And I almost want to scream that fucking word because it, it is nauseating to me that people very high up in management do not demand demonstration when we, when we talk about certain things. So people who understand things at a molecular level can demonstrate. You can strip them of all of their material, all of their tools and everything, and they can reconstruct it. Um, this is why I've always laughed at riot patches and, you know, metas and all this other type of stuff because you can you can talk about it at a molecular level um and explain it if you really know what's going on if you're sure. just copying off each other's cheat sheets and looking over your shoulder at what the other guy put on his test the way that most staffs and most managements uh you know uh are doing then of course you don't know what's going on yeah you know Did of course you look clueless and not like fucking tony stark in a cave uh an iron man yeah um yeah. and so I, like, I, I've, I've watched with yeah i've watched the way vagar breaks right. stuff down for players and it's yes it's exactly very exactly. very different than what most of the yes. teams i've seen and max was the same exact way yeah. and uh i think molecule does a really good job when he does do it at operating um to that extent and i think that this is a very very alien thing in the scene mm -hmm. and that's what max talked about and why he quit um or like one of the reasons that he quit and walked away um is because it, it it is not glor it, it's not ideal to want to be that person um hmm. and so to, to answer the question going back to it no one was ever getting caught by some taught by someone on a molecular level um so if that's the case then what good is it by just saying that the title inherently comes with the knowledge because we know that league of legends knowledge is not linear no we're gonna take a small break and talk about our sponsor poor professor Professor is an app that runs on Overwolf for LOL that provides all sorts of useful features, such as importing the best runes quickly during champ select and getting insights about how well your opponent plays their champion as soon as the game starts. One of the best features is obviously the player stats and tags during the pregame. Professor can help you improve your planning by labeling your opponents with distinct playstyle tags. This is why you spot aggressive jungler, pinpoint auto-filled players, and get warnings about those experiencing a cold streak. These details can offer a strategic advantage while you're basically loading into the game. Professor offers even more of a strategic advantage by providing critical insights that aid you in mastering your champions and better understanding of your matchups during the game that you can read. For those looking to improve their gameplay and rack up more wins, follow the link in my description and discover all that Professor has to offer. Okay. Yeah, that, so I, I hope that answer No, it, that, that raises, I mean, that raises a whole other area of conversation, but we probably don't have time for that. Yes. <clears throat> I would love to see- I mean, I have any, I have, it's up to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You're, you're going to pass out soon, right? No, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, so, no, no, no. I, yeah, I think I, I think development of coach, like, so the way I see, like, LCS organization right now, getting it to a point of which we are actually competing, right, doing well against it. One, we have the advantage of the organizational structure is already apparently better than theirs. Uh, what we need, yes. though, is to ha probably have a developmental coaching side of how do we teach coaches to coach? What's important actually in hiring a coach, right? And then division of roles. I, I think the head coach is a very different position than the strategic coach uh, from positional coaching. But yes. we've sort of merged all of that into one position. Be like, hey, this is the coach. They need to not only do draft and help players learn and teach them. They also have to manage the team organizational side. They need to be the middleman between the org and the players. Like, there's just a lot, a lot going on there, which you would never see in a in a professional sports organization of any other type. Right. So, but I, I also agree. Yeah. Like coaches, I mean, there's been a lot more of a, let's say a culling of the herd uh, in the last year or so. I think a lot of coaches have yeah. kind of been exposed, if you will, like it kind of pushed out and then. A lot of coaches who've kept jobs and even, you know, gotten promoted up and stuff like are demonstrating that knowledge more. I, I, I agree with Vagar. Like 
every coach, if you want to be a professional league coach, you should be putting out regular content, putting out video, putting mm -hmm. out analysis. Like, well, the the really cool thing is croissant, right? There mm -hmm. was that uh, there was that tweet after they won LCS that I retweeted. Was it you that tagged me? Yeah, and you, he was talking about you. It was you, right? Yeah, yeah he was talking about, about me. Magic, yeah. Croissant, I found on Reddit because when you demonstrate, and again, I want to fucking yell, <laughs> he demonstrated, right? He made a video. It was a demonstration. When when you demonstrate, either the dom demonstration is met with resistance, which then either goes back and forth. It's like a layering thing, right? Mm -hmm. You're baking a cake. And eventually someone will be closer, you know, to the, the treasure chests than the other. Um, and that's what it's all about. So yeah. croissant, um, me and croissant have been friends for many, many, many years. And croissant dealt with a lot of house of cards, some fucking Kevin yep. Spacey shit. Like, yep. uh, not like what he was accused of, but what yeah. I mean, like, um, <laughs> like actual, he, he went through like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, croissant, croissant went through hell. Yes. Um, behind the scenes, he was uh, wrongfully fired uh, or like removed multiple times because of political things that just happened within teams. Uh, and he bounced around from team to team. Um, and I think there were some instances where he did actually, he was like okay with leaving. So even though that was going on, it's it sort of whatever. But then he came out on top. And I think that's really good because he's always been an advocate of public demonstration. And he's always been someone that t chased uh, the molecular level of things. Yeah. And that's what should be glorified and it's not right um right. yeah no i i think it's it's really really good to see content from people like that um because not yes. only i think a lot of people they don't do it because they're actually afraid of being wrong right they're afraid of the the backlash of like well what if what if i put this video out and big rb2 takes it dissects it and objectively shows me why i'm wrong yes. that, that should be a good yes. thing that should be a good thing. Yes, it like, should be a good thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I publicized all my content because I wanted people to tell me that I was wrong. Yeah, and should explain because why, because now we, you learn. <laughs> right, 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 exactly, exactly. It's about who's closer to the treasure chest. Um, and then one of the things that I never, I guess, realized um, is that uh, my way of speaking with people that are not like peers mm -hmm. um, or something uh, just is abrasive, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess like something that I've learned in the last like year and a half or something with the autism diagnosis and all the um, stuff that I've read um, and all like the therapy and stuff is I can understand it, I guess, more, um, but it seemed like people didn't like that thing that we were just talking about where, you know, it's okay to be wrong as long as you learn. Mm -hmm. That should be the end goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think especially um, with specifically with that diagnosis, because because Vagar, you know, he also is, is like openly autistic, and he says, yeah. you, you're you're very literal. So it's not that you're abrasive; you're objectively saying what is incorrect about their statement, and people take offense to that. Nothing, nothing uh, I've yes. read him say or like seen and you either in direct well, response to someone's coaching stuff has been uh, a personal attack. Yes, yes, yes. This is something that also drove me mad when people say that I'm toxic and I always ask yeah. them, I implore them, please show me something. Because mm -hmm. if you ask me about a, a toxic League of Legends reputation person, mm -hmm. I do not need more than five minutes on Google. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if you want to see an actual toxic person, I, right. I, I need five minutes or less. I will get you a clip. I will get you a YouTube thing. I will get you a fucking tweet chain, sure. something. Um, I will not personally target someone unless they personally targeted me first. Right. Um, and that's just because you know, I believe in uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, <laughs> so like that, it's this really weird fucking narrative that existed around me and it circled me that I would be abrasive or rude to people. And I never, that's why I always ask the fucking question, like, please show me yeah. where that's actually happening. Cause well, I won't personally target them. Abrasiveness um, and not sugarcoating things are two very different things, you know? <laughs> That's another thing, yeah, but that one's harder for me to argue. Yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I can but, understand. But I, don't, but... I don't think you need to sugarcoat things, right? If, if someone is wrong and you're yeah. talking specifically in game, like this is wrong because of this, right? This is a bad macro play because of this. Th these, are, these are things that are clearly and demonstrably evident. Like these are not opinions, really, right? The right. opinion could yes, be, yes, yes. is it worth it or not? But really, it's like, okay, you, you reset here. You're going to lose six minions because of this. That is objective. There's there's no denying that, you know? And then the, the debate could be like, okay, whether or not this is a good or a bad thing. But then they want to say, oh, why are you flaming me on my video? Or why are you like coming after me and, and trying to like discredit me, you know? And I, it, it inevitably turns into just name calling and everyone's like, right. oh, you're, you're a fraud. And you're like, uh, okay. Um, and, and I think this is, again, not ELO specific. So whenever I've commented on Vagar's videos, for example, like he'll, he'll post something 
I, I try to approach it from not the point of uh, questioning what he's saying. It's usually asking for explanation, right? Like, I, I don't understand this. And he's never like flame me, like, oh, you're stupid, right? He's never once said that. It's always like, oh, he'll explain in very, very nuanced detail. This is exactly why I said this. And you're like, oh, that makes total right. sense. But I think a lot of people will go into his video and be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, what is this, Platt? And then like, how are you supposed to respond to that? Like, like there, there's no actual discussion there at all. But yeah. yeah. Well, I, I genuinely hope, I, I I know you mentioned this and if you want to elaborate further, you said you're about to quit too. Are you talking about league and specifically or, or just the engaging well, with? I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure. Right. Um, it, it, it's like weird. A lot of people think that I have like retired, like all this other stuff. It's very undecisive, um, for me right now. I don't know exactly what is going on, um, this year, uh, to an extent. Um, I am at the precipice for sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, that, that's a conversation that I still have to have with others. Um, yeah. I've been very caught up like, uh, the last two weeks or stuff, so, uh, with like my visa. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so I'm like trying to figure that out first before I figure oh, out like the next step. And it's also like publicly known that I like declined all like the coaching offers and stuff, mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. it was very close with FlyQuest. Uh, it was a two month conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that was declined at the very end of October, hmm. um, like October 24th, wow. 25th or something was maybe, uh, the decline. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think, I th well, right after CNN, you would, you had said, I'm never going to coach again. Right. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't, um, yeah, I, I, I really insisted that, um, it would not like be a thing, but, um, again, and that's why I think why the talks were two months. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Well, I guess there, what there was Yeah, what specifically was it about coaching that made you not want to do it again? We we trying to we trying to <laughs> we trying to talk about what happened. No, just in general, like like you don't I got, have to get I got the, all the, I, got, I got everything. You don't have to get into the details if you don't want to, but like, you know, like what 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 is it about being a, a head coach or a coach and a professional coach that made you not want to do it again? Well, um I made a lot of sacrifices to do the C9 jump. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, C9 was supposed to get me a visa. And here I am talking to you that I'm dealing with immigration stuff because mm -hmm. evidently that did not happen. Um, so the, the, you know, these types of, uh, like I uprooted everything, right? I left sure. T1, which T1 to me is still family, um, in a way, right? I'm very, very close with, uh, everyone at T1. Um, so I left T1, uh, that feels very, very bad. Um, I had like made all these preparations and stuff to just leave Korea. And it's very difficult for me, like as my home um, and with the visa stuff and everything yeah. like that. So there's this type of stuff. And then there is the infrastructural stuff that I perceived as, okay, if it's happening here, it's everywhere. And I already sort of knew um, where else it was happening. Um, but all I'm going to say is there's no, there's no coincidence that Max Waldo also quit a year after me. Sure. Yeah. And and that's something um, I yeah I talked to him a little bit after yes, that but he like, didn't get into details will, as to why but yeah yes everyone will flame me for the C nine stuff okay but please look at Max leaving so like that that is the that is the fucking golden treasure map clue um, Max leaving should just say enough yeah um, without like all of us fucking putting on a stream and fucking podcasting like so um so outside yeah. of the specific uh i guess experience that you had when you were c9's coach uh is there anything about being a coach itself that sort of dissuades you or is it more like i mean what no, makes no, you no, want no. to do i it? always yeah. i i love the players i mean i yeah. i i love players in general i, I love trying to help pro players right mm -hmm. like griffin the whole mm -hmm. thing so griffin if he's still in chat um he can attest to this i had to like fix him being able to join t1 twice um and so that happened right i opened my house to boot campers for the last decade um i'm always players first yeah uh so it, it has nothing to do with players i absolutely no, 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 love no, no, helping no. players that actually want to get better um in that department it's it's viewers first in the actual uh <laughs> you know it's viewers first well, when, when it comes to, to pro yeah yeah uh, you know, when, when, I, when it comes you know, to the longevity of our <laughs> career, yeah, it's viewers first. I, I really, I really hope uh, you don't leave the scene. You know, I, I really hope that you, you find some way to make it a, 
a mentally sustainable endeavor for yourself and try not to yeah. read too much into the negativity. Um, cause right, I do right, think right. like what you bring to the community is, is super valuable. Like you're raising discussion points that need to be raised and not a lot of people have either the audience or the, I think the capability that you have to like explain yourself. Um, right. But it sucks. You're, you're sort of this, uh, pioneer I've become of, luke skywalker yeah, yeah uh, but unfortunately you have you sort seventh of have, episode yeah <laughs> you you kind of yeah. have to oh, you have okay. to luke skywalker. you gotta you kind of have to take on the burden of also eating the flack you know like it, it it's i mean it's shitty, funny people you know? will condemn me and they'll hate me but again it always goes back to that that dreaded d word that they hate which is demonstrate right. um and it, it doesn't matter how long i am away from the game i'm always going to be able to demonstrate um Sure. Because there's very few people in the scene that operated at a molecular level. Um, and that's fine. And, you know, yeah, I, I'm okay yeah. with that. I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm okay it's... with being a reject. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> as, long, as long as it doesn't, you know, uh, I guess put you in a state in which you feel like it's not worth it. Or, you know what? Hey, maybe I'm screaming at nobody and, and nobody's actually listening. Because I, I do think, like, the more that we can actually have these conversations, eventually, eventually, hopefully someone with... The capabilities, uh, the the reach or the organization just decides to make the jump. Yeah. Like, yeah, changing changing things a little bit. So, um, but no, I, I think you come from a really really interesting background. Because I'm a huge StarCraft fan. I never played yeah. very much. Uh, I used to only play the uh, like the, the campaign. I I dabbled in multiplayer in StarCraft one a bit. And I got shit on. So I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm not okay. good enough. But I loved like StarCraft was the original esport for me. I used to watch all the pro yeah. StarCraft like. Um, Hell yeah. what, I was, was so, a favorite player. I mean, I was. You know what's interesting? I didn't even know this, but when TLO followed me on, I was like, "Wait, the TLO? Like T the TLO? Like I used to watch his yeah. play way back, and like Hell he yeah. owns Shopify. I'm actually a huge Shopify fan now. I'm like, I hope they do yeah. so well because like I used to love watching him play. Um, but like I, I was like, Starcraft to me will always be the pinnacle of it's. It's like esports chess i mean some people consider yeah. chess an esport i don't I, I consider chess its own thing but it's the original esport for me where the better player is gonna win like it was so yeah. evident who's better on a good day like yeah 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 absolutely absolutely yeah i also that was the beauty of it yeah i also i wish i almost wish league would adopt the uh the ff rule like that starcraft has the gg like if the game state is lost you can say gg and just go to the next but yes you know, yes, because yes, then yes. you can then you can oh, always have a best the, the surrender conversation uh, a little bit but uh, <laughs> okay but i i i do think that i i do think that it's, it's a different conversation from pro to solo queue i think in solo queue you're gonna get so many surrenders at 15 minutes that are not should not be surrendered uh like I, i'm having people like want to ff because they died level one in a jungle invade i'm like dude the game is not even started like they have 600 gold like relax you know like yeah uh, or like what 700 if they have two kills but like in in starcraft it's like okay there's a game state at which you lose a major fight and you like i don't have the time to rebuild my army in time for them to wipe me it's basically a lost game at this point so i i i, I thought about it a little bit um because obviously I, I i heavily disagree with the the sentiment that is shared by many on twitter of surrender voting i think that surrender vote rather than being a timer based thing um that it be locked behind a gold deficit the way that bounties turn on only if you're at a certain deficit or, um surrender should turn on if you're at a certain deficit um yeah that makes sense that makes sense yeah yeah I, that's I, a way yeah. to basically save time and then you can incorporate mathematics right um that allow you to basically say um that the likelihood that you win this game is is less than 10 percent right um, and then it allows you to incorporate mathematics because from that 10%, what people don't realize, and I think Azap doesn't realize this on Twitter, um, is that when you enter into the reality that the 10% occurs, okay? Uh, it's like fucking, um, you know, uh, what is it? Avengers, right? The fucking uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange. There's a lot of realities. There's a lot of realities where they get, where, where Captain Marvel fucking punches Thanos and then in 700,000 of them, they still lose, right? right? right. Um, so the, the thing is, is that the amount of realities where the 10% occurs, there's still a flowchart that comes after the 10%. Um, and you have to play out that flowchart. And that flowchart has a flowchart. Right. So you're not in the reality of the 10% just because there's a 
Um, sure. And then there's also like the, these, like the thing that I was trying to reference with poker and like this other type of stuff and, and trying to say like there's math and stuff is um, the amount of time commitment, right? If you're making a time argument, even if you are a 50 percenter um, or a 51 percent player, a 50 percent player, you can actually math out that time wise it is superior to quit in like the 10 percent or less scenarios. 100 um, yeah. percent. I'd rather I'd if rather play you're seven more games. games. Yeah. If you're willing to play games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're not willing to play games, then yes, you're supposed to stay in the ten percent scenario. I agree. I agree. Yes. If if I'm if I have so, enough time for one game, I'm playing that thing out. Correct. Like, so this argument falls yeah. apart the second that you answer the question: Are you going to play more games? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it's it's just math. It's not yeah. even it, it. You can't argue it. Right. Um. So it's really bizarre to me. Right. Yeah, and that's and I, don't, I don't care about people's emotions, and I, I, I think I, this is like one of the things that people get mad at me about. No, and I, I totally agree with that because also I know I know playing out the next thirty minutes of that nonsense where they're just griefing, and sometimes you just know, you know, you just look at them play, and you're like, we're not winning this because my team doesn't know how to team fight, and they're just griefing. They're, they're not making this game any more playable. It's I'm I'm more open to voting no. If you start seeing something trend in the right direction, oh, we got a good right, pick here. Right, we got an yeah, objective. Yes, 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 if you're doing yes, nothing yes, good, yes. just go next. You know, like everything is yes, falling yes, apart yes. faster and faster. Like you're better off yes. saving the time, saving the mental. Because the worst thing that happens is you get so tilted trying to argue with your team and trying to salvage this game, and then the next game you go into it and you're like already mentally this boomed. Is, like <laughs> the other thing is the the average League of Legends player now is in their mid twenties. Right. Time is different for us. Um, now I'm a streamer myself, but I, I can understand and respect the average person. Yeah. So time is not a infinite resource the way that it is for a streamer or a YouTuber like myself and ASAP and these other types of people. Sure. Okay. You forcing them to play out another 20 minutes and then go through a queue and stuff like that. They might not have that luxury just for your fucking 10%. Right. And then they're um, more frustrated. In a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they get more frustrated, yeah. and, and there's all these other types of things. Um, and we, we, th there's a lot of arguments that can be had here, both from an emotional spectrum and a mathematical spectrum um, and all this type of stuff. And so I think that's what frustrates me most. Yeah. Um, because I am of the surrender camp, and I, I think that the, the math is... Now, it, it's almost like an appeal to emotion where, um, you know, the Ashiba... Uh, sorry. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I just cursed in Korean. Um, <laughs> uh, something, something, uh, something, uh, okay. Sorry. Um, I, I, it, it's almost like, uh, yeah, an emotional response in a way where I'm trying to think how to word this actually. I'm sorry. Um, the 10%. Yes. Uh, you could have won some more games if you just tried harder in the 10%. Um, or something like that, right? Um, but again, it goes back to, are you just going to play more games? Because if you do, and you're even a 50% player, 51% player, um, there's the time argument, and you would end up actually uh, climbing more or, you know, all this other type of stuff. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. I mean, you're, you're right. It's, it's a mathematical thing. If you're winning 55% of your games, if you can fit two more games in that day, you have more net wins than if you played that one out. Uh, yeah. Like... Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you win two more games, I think it's what it's even, right? Yeah. You're equal to having won that. Um. Right. So this is where like you have to expand upon it with that ten to ninety percent. Right. 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 Um. And the ten to ninety percent game time average and like all this other type of stuff. I'm sure there's some equation someone can do. And maybe I'm I like, I, I am, you know, like pretty fucking sure there's not a universe where there's there's some like cross. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where it ends up being yeah. worth. Um, but again, this goes back to the thing. I'm, I'm willing to be wrong on, on this. Uh... But uh, I mean, the, the, it just doesn't, it, the whole argument lacks a lot of context because you're talking about a game that might be 10% winnable and a game that might be 20% winnable. And then we're being really nitpicky about how do you determine yeah, that when cool. nothing in the game tells you it's at that state, right? There's no right, like, right, right. So, graph or anything like, yeah, that's why I think the, the, the addition of surrender vote becomes active. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. no more timer. No yes, more 15 minutes. I agree. Because it is so hard to get a 4,000 gold deficit if you're chain inting. You can't because you can't give gold over. Right. I so agree. Yeah. the surrender vote actually comes online earlier than 15 minutes. Right. Um, and it scales, and it scales it's with time. it's a lot more reasonable. Right. Yeah, right, it scales right, with right, time. Because right. then if, if you're at 25 minutes and they're up 10K gold, like, okay, you're probably not winning. Like, how are you going to yes, get 10K yes, gold yes. back, you know?
Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot more sense. Having a having a better, uh, I guess, I mean, this goes across league in general, though. I've had arguments with people about this too, that there's no analytics in league that makes sense. I'm like, that makes absolutely no sense to me. How is a game ever not able to be broken down by statistical analysis when there's a clear metric for strength and power relative to each team? Like, that doesn't make sense. People are like, oh, you can never develop a system in which you could analyze good performance from bad. And I think that's such a, I, I I almost feel like I'm hitting a brick wall because obviously people are going to try to throw all these really specific scenarios in and, and overall nuance, but like you can generally say which team is doing better numerically by a whole right. bunch of different metrics, right? And so how could you not yeah. show which players are statistically playing better for their role and you and uh, champion compared to other players of similar similar role champion and ELO? It doesn't make sense. Um... Yeah, for ELO, for solo queue and stuff like this, I think that, that this stuff can be more tangible, but for pro play, I think it's a lot more. Yeah, 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 pro play is very different, right? I'm talking specifically, because again, this goes back to my MMR argument of like, how can you not reward or punish good or bad behavior, like performance in a game when they say oh, it's impossible, they have to go off win-loss? Because mathematically, it's easier just to say over 100 games, if you're better, you will slowly climb and it's fine. Right. But, you know, it's a bigger issue of like people honestly for whatever reason don't think that there's any sort of statistical analysis that makes sense in league um not that there's none uh yeah i know that like um have you ever had these talks with max or no yeah a little bit a little bit he, okay uh, Matt, yeah, max no, got real cerebral not... about gold uh, did you ever talk to you about this his philosophy about gold. Oh, we, talk, we talk about everything. Like, yeah, right. his, he explained yeah. this to me once, but golden game is actually a metaphor for like life and time. Yes, and, time, time. <laughs> yes. I was like, yeah. all right, Max, I, I like where this is going. But <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. no, very good. Very good. Yeah. His time uh, metaphor. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it makes a lot. But you know, it, it, to, to his credit, like I've never had a conversation like that with anyone else in the scene. So it makes a lot of sense. Like, as to why he sometimes probably felt like, okay, why am I not able to communicate with these people? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and this used to be the, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, and it, it sounds, it sounds crazy, but again, again, it goes back to the D word. Max could certainly demonstrate. Yeah. Um, yeah. and people don't want the demonstration. Um, or if they do see the demonstration, there's no discernibility. Mm -hmm. Um, so for instance, right. I, I told you just a moment ago that, um, <clears throat> Paul uh, uh, told me so many things on a, um, you know, like a molecular level about what's happening with the human body, the muscles, mm -hmm. the digestive tract, et cetera, right? When he was doing my personal training. I can't say if Paul's lying. <laughs> like, I can't. There, there's, I, I do not have an ability to. Even if I go on YouTube <clears throat> and I watch 100 videos, I still lack um, the, the knowledge to actually call him a liar. Sure. Um, in a way, right? And that is a real thing. So now what if there's two Pauls? What if there's another person with a doctorate who also is ripped and who has also done personal training for other people and this person starts saying this? All right. Well, if you ever... Now if you, you have, have two people... If, if you ever have questions, feel free to shoot them my way. I'll let you know. <laughs> no, no, no. But you, you know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. Imagine there's two people arguing or right. attempting to right. argue at a molecular level because we don't have that in league. But imagine you have two people <clears throat> attempting to argue at a molecular level. The next step is demonstration. Right, right. So we, in, we know this in the scientific world. So we know this with like, you know, counteracting flat earth. We know this with counteracting, you know, scientific methods and stuff. We know this with certain YouTube channels where acclaimed professors across the world challenge these absolutely, um, you know, nonsense things and they demonstrate. So yeah, it goes back to the D word. proof and there's evidence. The LTS ecosystem, yeah. Yeah. LEC, everyone, they don't like the D word. Right. They don't like the D. They like, they like, they like like belief. They like, they like faith and they like belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They like faith. <laughs> yes. It's very faith. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it's it's crazy because it's almost like uh, in a faith basis that you they, they put the East on a pedestal and they're like, oh, everything they're doing must be somehow magical and different. And like, it just it's un, unattainable. But what you're describing is actually they're just winging it sort of, but they have such good players. It works and they have a system in which is a little more chaotic, but it, it sort of sorts itself out. Right. The better players are going to kind of group together and find other good players and they're going to work together and play and beat everybody. Yes. <laughs> That's also wild because to me, it's like, that should be something easily exploitable, 
right? Like every, the, the thing right. that makes no sense to me about league specifically is I've gotten into so many conversations and arguments with people, especially at the coaches and all that stuff about why is league different than any other skill, any other performance-based skill that we know we, that we have as human beings. Why is league unique? And none of them can answer that for me because I'm always like what I'm explaining in terms of structuring practice a certain way, skill acquisition, sandboxing, repetitive scenarios, yes, yes, yes. iterations. Yes. This is stuff that transform, like it, it transcends yes, it everything. And this is how humans learn. But why is league different? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, the league is too complex for that. Like bullshit. Like there's nothing. No, it's not. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing, yeah, yeah, and we, you know, like. So in StarCraft, um, so Forrest Within calls uh, teams out for this all the time on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. um, he mentions how no teams do sandboxes. No teams do, uh, you know, 3v3s uh, with jungler. And obviously, like, at C9 or Korea 9, we did blitz scrims. Yeah. And it was after blitz scrims that the terminology got more popularized. Some teams would say that they use them. I don't know. Silent scrims was another thing on C9. Mm -hmm. um, because when there's a silent scrim, that's akin to, you know, someone who's popping, you know, Tylenol all the time. You take them off the Tylenol, you find out where it hurts. Yeah. Um, in some ways, right? You, yeah. you get to know a new symptom because you remove uh, the anti-inflammatory. So uh, silent scrims are really good in a lot of ways for diagnosing. Um, another thing that's really good, and we never got around to it, Jack didn't order it, um, uh, well, didn't order a lot of stuff, um, was uh, uh, heart rate monitors. Mm -hmm. Heart rate monitors can tell if a player has anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to heart rate monitors, you can also monitor a player's breathing rate. Mm -hmm. um, to try to tell these other types of things, which now allow you to symptom treat. Well, not even, no, you're not symptom treating necessarily. You're getting to the underlying cause. You're getting to a molecular level. It, these types yeah. of things are really important. Um, I, I, talked, I talked a lot with them about that, actually, because they were asking my opinion on how to better integrate that technology. And I was like, the problem is we don't have a lot of causation. We have a lot of correlation, maybe, right? They might have an increased heart rate. They might have increased breathing yes. rate, which would indicate that they have a sympathetic mm -hmm. response to this stuff. But at least it you have to there, yes. you, you have to pair it to the game and then you have to see yes. does yes. that some players you might see that elevated heart rate and then they pop off or right. you might see all that stuff and they make a horrible decision right and so you have to then individualize that information too and contextualize it but uh it, it is super interesting because most i, I mean nobody nobody's really tracking all that at a, at a good level yet um so one of the really fun things and uh, you know if papa smithy heard this or something he would know exactly what i'm talking about i brought up a metric for player evaluation that i use in scouting that apparently um now papa smithy is one of the most weathered people in the scene sure uh, and he's never heard me talk about it on stream um and he said he never heard anyone talk about this and this was something that me and max sort of realized in 2020 um, and I'm very vocal about it. Um, I'm not as vocal as like other things. I think actually it's one of the least mentioned things that I do. Um, I watch uh, people's mouse hmm. um, because mouse, uh, the, sorry, the, the person's mouse is inside into their subconscious. Hmm. So where they're hovering their mouse, and this is why I demand first person views when I try to evaluate a player, it, it doesn't matter what they're actively attacking or where their last skill shot was, where their positioning was, etc. The mouse is their brain. Because League of Legends players play on a very reactionary level. Yeah. They, 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 it's all muscle memory. A lot of stuff is muscle memory. So what does that mean if it's muscle memory? Well, okay, show me where the person's muscle's at. Show me where the person's brain is going to before it's even there. You can only see that through where their mouse is hovering. Like, like they're no hovering. No fucking coach. They're, they're hovering. Yes, yes, no back coaches space. So no, it's like, no one. Like, okay, like they want to attack. Their mouse is going to be kind of towards the wave, towards the enemy. And right, where are they versa. clicking, and what does I that see. click say? So if you um if you if you go to my tweets from Worlds, I actually point out why I can criticize Noah in a team fight because his clicks allows me insight into his subconscious. Hmm. He's clicking away because he's afraid, but there was nothing to be afraid of, which means that he actually can't keep up with the speed of the fight. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, and, and it was happening yeah. multiple times. That's this comes from the hover of the mouse. Yeah, and um, you have to you have to see that first person because if they don't click, you don't know that. Yes, correct, yeah, correct, yeah. correct. And no one in their mother talks about it, and no one has ever done that. Um, <laughs> so like, this brings uh, back the Vagar, every the Vagar single time meme. I talk to someone about it, they're like, "I've never, uh, I don't do that, or uh, I've never thought to do that," because no, almost no one demands first person vods. I, I mean, Vagar got memed a lot on the, the the bad clicks thing, but it's it's so true. 
Like it's very true. It's the person's one, brain. It's one one bad, bad click. One bad click ruins ruins whatever you were doing. Sometimes it's so bad. Yes, sometimes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The, the the meme that like you know Busio goes wrong with it like good clicks or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, bad click is not just clicking bad. Uh, mm -hmm. You can have bad clicks like you could have misclicked in team fights or like mm -hmm. you could have lost focus in that one fight. When I'm saying that a person has bad clicks, it's over the course of many, 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 many vods of their first person view. Okay. Um, because it's where their mouse is hovering. Hmm. And that's why I was so sad when um Pro View went away. Yeah, I I, I never I don't understand why they removed that. I mean, that's actually yeah something so valuable for both coaches and and fans. Like just as like you can learn so much just watching a pro player from their view how they play the lane and stuff like that. Like I don't understand why they would remove it, but yeah, I mean maybe it costs them money. I have no idea. Right. <laughs> I know the inner workings of Riot. Um. Yeah. Wait, it was profitable and they made money. I I don't know the financials. So, um. Cool. Uh. Well. What are some things that you're excited for this coming year? League or not? Mm. I mean, we just started the year. I mean, it's a fresh start. Hopefully I can fix my, my, uh, my visa stuff and oh, get yes. my permanent residence. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There's not much I really look forward to. Um, they're sort mm. of like a calmness. Like when I made like the joke, like Luke Skywalker reference earlier mm -hmm. on, where like mm -hmm. he's secluded on that fucking island, doesn't talk to anyone. I mean... That really does look like the trajectory that I'm going towards. Um, hmm. I have like my apartment here, like locked into contract for three more years, so um, I might just disappear. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not totally certain yet. There's like conversations I have to have with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I have to know what's going on with my Korean visa. Yes. Um, yes. I'm like still gonna be doing stuff, uh, like you know, like the patch rundowns and stuff on FlyQuest channel is still gonna be there. I'm still gonna be LS behind the scenes, but um yeah i don't know yet uh okay. is i guess the best answer yeah I mean, well best of luck with the visa thing and hopefully you know you find a newfound passion for what it is you want to do this year and, and kind of pursue it i think you're gonna be great just keep up uh keep, i i hope you continue doing stuff with with the league community because i i enjoy it um and would love to you know chat with you again on some of this stuff but yeah have a yeah. thank you so much for doing this again um i really appreciate it hope you had a great new year's yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. I think it was very enjoyable. So, good. You know. cool. <laughs> so, All right. Good. All right, All right. man. Take care. Have okay. a good rest of your All day. Right. See, See you later. Later. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. All right, guys.